Hello and welcome to the big gear video. In this video I will cover all of the gear that I used in last year's calendar year triple crown and how the gear changed along the three trails. I will cover the thought process behind why I brought certain pieces of gear and also how that gear held up over a 7400 mile through hike. I am playing around with AI pictures as well so that's why nothing will look quite right in this video. First let's cover the big three that includes your backpack, your shelter, and your sleeping system. I used a Hyperlite Mountain Gear Wind Rider 3400 that's a 55 liter pack. I wanted the Dyneema Hyperlite Mountain Gear pack because I knew I would experienced a lot of rain on the AT. I started on the AT on February 16th and I didn't want to deal with a pack cover or have to worry about a pack liner leaking. And it worked out really well even on very heavy rainy days. At most I would get a little bit of moisture inside my pack uh, but it wasn't a big deal. My pack didn't get soaked through and the Hyperlite Mountain Gear was a perfect compromise between an ultralight backpack like a Palante and something more traditional like an Osprey. So my pack fully loaded down will usually be 30 to 35 pounds, sometimes 40 plus if there's a long food carry. And so I liked having a frame and having a hip belt to help distribute that load. So the Wind Rider, it comes in right around two pounds. It's the perfect mix of a lightweight, durable, roomy, and comfortable pack. For a shelter, I used the Hyperlite Mountain Gear Unbound two-person tent. I picked it up halfway through the AT, so it traveled over 6,000 miles with me, so my pack and the shelter both lasted for over two and a half through hikes. Having such long lifespans is pretty important when you're looking at these more expensive pieces of equipment. The Unbound uses trekking poles to get it set up and I found it to be easier and quicker to set this up than more traditional tents that I've used like the Big Agnes or the Nemo Hornet tents. I use the tent through a lot of different weather conditions, snowstorms, rainstorms, thunderstorms, and it held up through all of those. There wasn't any situation where I uh, got wet inside of the tent. The only downside to a single wall tent like this is condensation will build up on the inside. So for the Appalachian Trail, that's more of a concern, but when you're out west on the PCT or CDT, condensation isn't nearly as much of an issue. I'm pretty sold on trekking pole tents now versus more traditional tents because you don't give up anything in terms of room or usability, and it saves you a lot of weight, and they're easier to set up, so all those means for me um, trekking pole tents make the most sense. For my sleep system on the Appalachian Trail I use a Katabatic 15 degree flex quilt along with a Thermarest Neo Air X-Lite sleeping pad. On the Pacific Crest Trail I use the Katabatic 30 degree flex quilt with a Nemo switchback foam sleeping pad and then on the Continental Divide Trail I switch back to the 15 degree quilt I use a Thermarest Neo Air again as the sleeping pad and then I got a Nunatak Apex overbag when it got really cold. I am very impressed by the quality of the Katabatic quilts. So when they say the bag is 15 degrees, that means you can be comfortable inside of that. And I found when it got even colder, I could put on all of my layers and I, could, I was comfortable going down to single digit temperatures inside of that 15 degree flex quilt. And the two quilts held up really well through this. I'm confident that I can take either quilt on an entire another through hike and it'll hold up just fine. I don't think I'll ever go back to a traditional sleeping bag. There's just so many more benefits of a quilt and that weight savings is really vital. The Thermarest inflatable sleeping pads, they're certainly very comfortable and very lightweight, uh, but I had two of them fail on me this year. One of the baffles popped and then the other one just sprung a leak. So that's the danger of these inflatable sleeping pads is that when they do have failures, it can really make your sleep very uncomfortable. And then when you add in the fact these pads are starting to be over $200, it becomes hard to justify something that's not even going to last you through an entire through hike. So I think if the weather permits, I would just much rather carry a foam pad like the Z Lite or the Nemo Switchback that I use. Those are just so much cheaper. They're really simple. You can use them as breaks in the day. Just lay it out, take a nap on the middle of the trail, and they they don't fail like the uh, inflatable sleeping pads do. But they are less comfortable. I definitely get better sleep on the inflatable pads. So there's pros and cons to both sides, and it's really a matter of like your budget and how much you can tolerate sleeping with less cushioning underneath you. 
shoes and socks. So I went through three different models of shoes this year before I found one that I think works really well for through hiking. I started out on the Appalachian Trail wearing Ultra Lone Peaks. These are probably the most popular through hiking shoe and they work fine and there's nothing wrong with them but by the time I was going through New Hampshire and Southern Maine I was wishing I had a little bit more cushioning so then I switched to the Lone Peak Temps. I wore these on the Pacific Crest Trail and I found that I didn't like the little vent holes they have on the bottom of these temps. They let in a lot of extra dirt and dust which then created blisters for me. And then finally I switched to the Ultra Olympus. These have much more cushioning and I like these a lot. I definitely noticed my feet would hurt less at the end of the day wearing the Ultra Olympus versus the Ultra Lone Peaks. And so these are the shoes that I'm going to stick with for the rest of my through hiking. The debate between boots and trail runners has been done to death and it's pretty settled. Just wear trail runners. Um, you will be more comfortable, you'll have less blisters and your feet will hurt a lot less in trail runners versus boots. But what about cold weather? What about snow? What about those conditions? And so my solution to that was to add in waterproof socks. Because it doesn't matter how waterproof your boots or shoes are, on a through hike they are going to get wet. And then if your shoes are big and bulky or if you have big bulky boots that are waterproof, they're going to take forever to dry out. So the better solution is to wear your regular trail runners and then you add in a layer of these I use seal skins waterproof socks, they're neoprene socks and they're not necessarily to keep your feet dry but they will keep your feet warmer. That layer, that waterproofing layer will lock in the warmth to your feet and I get these a little bit large so that I wear them over my regular darn tough socks. You know as far as regular socks goes, uh, darn tough works really well. They have lifetime guarantees when you get holes in them you can get them replaced for free so I don't think there's any reason to use any other kind of sock but I wear my regular darn tough socks and then if it's a cold day where my feet need to be warmer then I will put on the pair of waterproof seal skin socks. And these work really great for me. I use them going through New Hampshire and Maine in winter conditions. I use them going through Colorado and northern uh, New Mexico when there were just feet of snow on the ground and it was getting below zero degrees outside. And I never had any issues with my feet being too cold, like not even a hint of frostbite. So my feet were perfectly safe and it was a great solution to not have to wear big, heavy, warmer boots. Layers and rain gear. I'm not too particular about base layers. I usually just get whatever is on sale. I did get a lot of questions about my Jolly Gear. Those are the colorful shirts that you see, the orange and the purple ones in my videos. Those are the triple crown button down from Jolly Gear. For mid layers, I started out with a Northwest Alpine micro grid hoodie. These microgrid hoodies work really well in kind of cold conditions into spring and fall. When it's about 30 to 40 degrees out, you can keep these on comfortably all day and they'll keep you warm without making you sweat too much. On the PCT, I switched over to a Farpoint OG Direct Alpha hoodie as my mid-layer and I really like these because they weigh about half as much as any traditional mid-layer and they keep a lot of warmth for that little amount of weight. For a puffy, I took the Enlightened Equipment Torrid jacket. At 8.5 ounces, they're significantly lighter than other puffies on the market. With that weight savings, you do sacrifice a little bit of warmth, but if I were spending a lot more time in camp on cold days, I might opt to have a heavier puffy. Since I spent most of my days moving, the Torrid worked really well to keep me warm at night inside of my tent and sleeping bag. And in the mornings as I started moving around, packing up, and hiking out before the sun came out. So the choice of a puffy really hinges on how much time you're going to spend in camp and how cold it is outside. I think for most normal season through hiking, a Torrid will be more than enough. And at 8.5 ounces, it really does save quite a lot of weight. I use the Enlightened Equipment Visp as my rain jacket. At first glance, it doesn't provide confidence as far as keeping you dry because it looks so thin and fragile, but I found that it stayed waterproof for the entire year and is significantly lighter than more traditional rain shells that I've used in the past. 
It doubles as a wind layer and shell on really cold days. I wore several different pairs of rain pants along the trip. I had some from Northwest Alpine, I had some from Outdoor Research, and then just some other random ones I picked up in gear shops. I found that all of the rain pants would start to rip along the crotch, and I think that might just be a fact of the materials that they're made of along with that motion and the friction of the pants rubbing together when you move. If you wear it on a daily basis, they're just all going to rip. Having a stove on trail and cooking is one of those variables that is very personal. I started out with a stove and I switched to cold soaking about halfway through the AT because I found that I was in town so much that I wouldn't miss one or two warm meals at night. But then when I switched back over to the PCT, I found I needed to pick up a stove again because I just wasn't eating as well being out three, four, five nights at a time trying to eat cold snacks all day. I carried an MSR pocket rocket stove that runs on isobutane fuel along with a Vargo titanium pot. There are systems that are more ultralight like alcohol stoves, but I like the convenience and speed of isobutane with the pocket rocket. I figured getting my food cooked faster at camp and thus being able to go to bed earlier was worth the extra few ounces of carrying that fuel in the can. And I found personally that I will eat more food and eat more calories if I'm able to warm it up and cook like a big batch of ramen noodles or something like that, opposed to just trying to eat cold cheese and chips and tortilla wraps. So that ultimately I think works out in my favor to have those extra calories versus trying to save a couple extra ounces. The Sawyer Squeeze is the standard water filter that most through hikers use and they have worked great for me on all of my hikes. The main thing to look out for is to make sure you get the squeeze model and not the mini model. The mini model is just too small and it has a too slow of a flow rate and it becomes really annoying to use after a while. When you're out in cold weather, you want to make sure to keep that filter next to your body for body warmth during the day and when you're sleeping because if the water inside the filter freezes, then that can rupture the membranes that filter out the particulates and then that can get you sick. So just if the temperature is below freezing, make sure that filter is sitting next to your body so that it doesn't freeze. I'll touch on a few items that will be relevant for most hikers here. You can see my full list in the link down below. Since a smartphone is so useful now for navigation and planning and getting in contact with people, having an external battery to keep that phone charged is really important on a through hike. I carried a Nightcore 20,000 milliamp hour battery. This is probably overkill for most people. Most people can get away with a 10,000 milliamp hour battery, but since I have my camera equipment and more electronics, I used a bigger battery. I've used both an Anchor and Nightcore batteries and they both work well and they both hold their charge through an entire through hike. So as long as you're not letting them drain all the way completely very often or letting them get super cold all the time, they should keep their battery life um, throughout your entire hike. In addition to a good battery, you need a good wall charger and a good cord because if you get a cheap cord or a cheap wall charger, those can be limiting factors to how fast your battery can charge. I've seen hikers who picked up a replacement cord or wall charger from the gas station and it takes them more than 24 hours to charge a 10k battery and that is just too long especially if you're trying to move quickly. So having a quality wall charger, I use anchors and then just having a quality cord, um, USB-C cord that goes between the charger and the battery is really important for fast charging. I used a Nightcore NU25 headlamp. Um, I really like this headlamp. It's rechargeable and it holds a great charge. So most nights I would hike four to six hours and on one charge, the headlamp would stay for that entire time. So I never had to worry about it running out of charge. And then because it is rechargeable, I can just recharge it that night off of my portable battery bank and then it would be fully charged again. So I could just night hike every night like that. And again, if you're gonna be night hiking a lot like this, you want a little bit of a bigger battery bank so you don't run out of power. I carried a Garmin InReach Mini. I really like the Garmin InReach Mini. It allows you to do two-way texting, it allows you to do tracking, and it has an SOS button, so if you need help, you can press that button. This was something that I didn't think I would need when I first started hiking, but over the years, I've met enough people and had enough experiences on trail where people needed to press that SOS button for help, and oftentimes, it wasn't necessarily a life-threatening emergency, but there's a lot of different scenarios out there where if you need to call for help and you don't have cell phone access, you can be in a really bad spot. And I like the Garmin because 
you can do two-way texting, so maybe you don't necessarily need emergency help, but you can at least text a trail angel or text someone back home to help you out. So um, I think this is a really necessary piece of kit because it's really silly to put yourself in a situation where you might be uh, facing life-threatening situations and not be able to call for help just because you're trying to save a couple hundred dollars. So that's it for the video. I appreciate you watching. There's a link down below for a full write-up and that goes into more detail about how my gear changed along the three different trails. In a little bit more detail, I didn't cover every single little thing that I had in my pack in this video. That would have just been too long. But um, yeah, check out that link. Thanks for watching and uh, have a great day.